Hallelujah, yes, there is no night yet. Yeah. In Jesus is our light, and we need no candlelight here. Yeah. Hallelujah, there is no night there. Yeah. Let me hear you, bro. Zubaza. In Zion, I tell you, no night there. Hallelujah, there is no no night there. In Jesus is our light, and we need no other light yet. Hallelujah, there is no night there. Back up, help me, no night there. Say. Christ is Fire 
Yesu ni nasiafu anu Mukocha epono Ehum kasi etu ye Aso chipu pomu Ewiemu ye hum 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 Yesu sawi yu Hadinye na yeti Ehum kasi tu ye Aso chipu pomu Ewiemu ye hum 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 Yesu sawi yu hum 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 Hadinye na yeti Oyo nyamia Se omane saswa Se omane saswa Oha unyina yedi Oyo nyamia Se omane saswa Se omane saswa Adi nyina yedi nyamie Se omane saswa Se omane saswa Adi nyina yedi Adi nyina yedi
Satan came to steal, he came to kill and to destroy, but then Jesus came, that you may have life abundance, yeah, 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 yeah. If the sun shall set you free from the law of sin and death, I'm telling you, you shall be free indeed. And if the spirit of life begin to operate in your life, I'm telling you, brother, sister, auntie, pastor, doctor, everything's gonna be alright. Say, everything's gonna be alright. Everything's gonna be alright. Everything's gonna be alright. Everything's gonna be alright. Hey, everything's gonna be alright. Everything's gonna be alright. Everything's gonna be alright. Everything's gonna be up. Say wo yo. Wo yo. Wo yo 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 yo. Wo yo. Wo yo 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 Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Iwi iwi iwi. I really oh oh. Iwi iwi iwi. I really oh oh. I really oh oh. Say wo yo. Wo yo. Jesus, we love you, we love you. Jesus, we love you, we love you. No, Jesus, no life. Everybody help me sing, sing. Now let us welcome Minister Joe Agawus. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe you want to dance more. Hallelujah. 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 Nyame wa yem ye wa yem ye wo koda nyame wa yem ye. I want to hear you. Did you come with your clap? Can you clap for Jesus? It's an atra da atra de mu. Nyami wa yem ye se. Wa yem ye. Oh nyami wa yem ye se. Bomwe. Give a lot of clap. Why am I here? Oh, yeah, me, why am I here? Let me feel your clap here. Oh, yeah, me, why am I here? Ah, can you lift it up? Can you lift it up? Oh, yeah, me, why am I here? Can you lift it? Let me hear you. If you came with your hand got it. Oh my come forward. Come forward. May you are ya da da da. May you are ya. To hallelujah. It is a Pentecostal praise. Can you lift it? May come forward. Come on, lift your hands, say now. Do you want to? Do you want to? Lift it, lift it. Come on, lift it. Don't be ungrateful. May you are here. Can you lift your hands? Lift it. Why you Yeah. 
Hey, the man friendly, that's a radium. Oh, yes, I'm a man. Hey, me, a man friendly, that's a radium. Oh, yes, I'm a man. I are is a wonderful, I want you need me name so young when me. Hey, I are is a wonderful, I want you need me name so young when me. Hey, me name so young when me. Reverend Franklin Nana Ajiman. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together. Oh, clap, clap. Clap. Dr. Michael Bodin Yamiche is in. Hallelujah. Shall we rise to our feet as we welcome them? Shall we rise to our feet? Shall we rise to our feet? Let's stand to our feet. As, as Minister Andy welcomes them in. Let's keep, let's keep clapping. So they come, let's keep clapping. Let's have some song at the background. To you, Bonnie, Bonnie, Bonno, no one else but you, Bonnie, Bonnie, Bonno, no one else but you, Bonnie, Bonnie. Oh, no, no one else but you. Give a mighty clap unto the Lord. Shall we clap? I am Shall who we clap? I am clap? because of you. If it had not been for you, tell me where would I be? I was lost with sinking deep in sin. But you reach out your hand and rescued me. No one else can do the things you do. Oh God. Amen. Amen. Give a mighty clap unto the Lord once again. You can have your seats. Amen. Oh, amen. How many of you know he's God all by himself? There is none compared to him. Amen. Your 
repent. You call for light out of darkness. You don't need a man to be the God you are. But you have chosen to call us your own. He's got times and seasons in his hands. He calls for light out of darkness. He doesn't need a man to be the God he is. But he has chosen to call us his own. You are God. Help us sing. You are God. Lift up your hands in the camp to the maker. There's no place for us. your neighbor and tell your neighbor that the God we serve is a miracle working God. Oh, he didn't get it. Say the God we serve is a miracle working God. Hallelujah.
serve a miracle working God. There is nothing too hard for him. When he speaks, he works signs and wonders. We serve a miracle working God. Everybody can say, serve a miracle working God. There is nothing, there too, is hard. nothing too hard for him. When he speaks, when he speaks, he works signs and wonders. We serve a miracle. We serve a miracle. We serve a miracle working God. There is nothing too hard. So when he speaks, when he speaks, we wear signs and wonders. We sell a miracle. Are you ready for it? Sing the God we sell. He's a miracle working God. He's a miracle working God. He will never fail. He will never fail. Stand on your feet and rejoice in the glorification of the Lord. Are you ready to sing with me? Oh, eh, oh, oh, eh, oh, eh, oh, eh, oh, eh, oh. This is God of miracles. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Oh, you can do it better. Do it where? If somebody do something that it please you, we'll give him a mighty of hallelujah. You look so beautiful. And you do well. God bless you. Hallelujah. How many of us are happy to be here tonight? No, I don't see you. How many of us are happy to be here tonight? How many of us are happy to be here tonight? And I want to see you standing and give a shout to Christ Jesus, our Lord. Shout like never before. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And please be seated for a few minutes. Amen. I welcome you to the house of God. Welcome to Banner of Grace Ministries. And welcome to the Go Wings Conference 2018. Today is the, the beginning of the great program. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, let me take this opportunity to introduce uh, fellow ministers who are coming and you know, pay us visit. Let's give it up to Pastor Ernest of Victory Bible Church, Ashama Zin, and my good friend, 
Pastor Ni Osabute. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And help me welcome all the ministers. Yes, my, my friends. Yes, <laughs> you Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> they, they, they give me a source of inspiration. All right. And sometimes you, I sit back and I watch it. At least for once, God has helped me to raise a man in him. Then they, they will be <laughs> just. I'm on quite ginger at time. <laughs> Yes, sir. What, what I'm quite saying now, sir. This year, this. Obey Walentimu Mwamu. Praise the Lord. Obey Tony. Obey Tony Freedom this year. He will sell his freedom. Now, man, Tim. Now, Jamie, you are going to sell your freedom. Amen. Tonight will be a night. I didn't hear you. I said, tonight will be a night. Hallelujah. I, I have known him for, for childhood. We have been friends for 28 years. We are like brothers. We sleep together. We talk together. And we have been this friend for, 20, for 28 years. Hallelujah. He's a great man. A man full of wisdom. Humble. Insight of the word of God. His ministry has moved across from the four corners of the church. The corporate will accept him. The business will accept him as well as the church. He's a great man. So in the next few minutes, I want you to if the media people are ready, let's move on them. Dr. Bwedi Nyamicha is an internationally recognized speaker, a life coach and a leadership architect in business. He is a respected and renowned author, an educator, author, an educator living a life of excellence. His influence crosses boundaries across the globe. He employs a keen sense of dynamic teaching style that translates complex biblical principles into practical applications. His messages are known to motivate and encourage individuals to uncover their potentials and talents. He's the founder and general overseer of the Maker's House. Today, he's going to be a blessing to us. Church, let's welcome Dr. Bwedi Namiche. And help me welcome my good friend, my brother, Dr. Bwedi Namiche. Yes. Praise. Praise God. Um, it's been a very long time since I came here. And fortunately, your faces haven't changed much. It means you've remained evergreen. And I believe that there are greater things that God will want to do with your life. Um, if you are alive and your hands are yours, can I have you clap unto the praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, Banner of Grace happens to be my home. It's a place where I will come in a heartbeat. I don't have to think about it, pray through it. I don't have to make consultations and conferences over it before I decide to come. Because the work that is being done here is worthy of support. And it's a great work that God has used a man who has been selfless, dedicated, and equipped, single-minded, a focused man um, to do these things. I mean, if you see what has happened here over the years and the plan and the vision to do things for God, as far as this assignment is concerned, you don't need a soothsayer, a prophet, a bishop, or an apostle to tell you that it's a mandate that is on the heart of God. It's a commission that God supports. We're talking myself. I mean, he told you that... Um, we are, we are friends, but, but he's a brother to me as well. And um, quite recently, we were in Kumasi to see up, to celebrate the one week of Bishop Nicholas Asari, and we slept 
on the same bed in the hotel, the same bed. Not separate rooms, then we meet. Same bed. Um, he sleeps here, I sleep there. And when he's not doing right, I can look at him and fight him. I mean, that's the beauty of a good relationship where there is no cosmetics and no hypocrisy. He will tell you that sometimes I'll, I'll take him in my car, we'll drive, and it's all about fight. It's not any pleasantries. It's somebody I've known for years. And in life, you need people that can tell you to your face when you are not doing the right thing. And that you can also tell in their face and not talk behind them. Throughout my lifetime, I've learned not to do something, to talk behind people. So if I have a problem with you, I'll let you know I have a problem with you. And I'll show it. But this is the, a great church, a fantastic man of God. Um, in this day and age where pastors and ministers are into the amassing of material things, and where buying cars and properties have become the order of the day. If you meet a man that has a heart to move the kingdom, think it is just prudent and wise for all of us to rally behind such a vision. I came here today to share with you some few words, to pray with you as well. Um, but I also want to celebrate all the leaders of this house. I've seen my junior from school. Now he's a big man. He's my junior. He was a young man. My junior. Cross. A crack. But he's a great man. And thank God for your life and that you've availed yourself. I've seen men of God. God bless you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you. And you guys look amazing. Um, I don't know. Is it, is it that to be a member of the choir, you have to possess certain qualities? Because it appears that the ladies are too beautiful. And so I'm wondering, I don't know about the men, but I'm talking about the ladies. Okay, so the men are fearfully made. And the ladies are wonderfully made. That's a good combination. But you are, you, you are doing well. Thank God for you. God bless you. Amen. Tonight, uh, do you mind if I step down? I can. I can. I don't need that. That's fine. Please. Um, tonight is the introductory night, and um, I wouldn't want to take all your time. But I want us to handle certain pivotal things that are concerned, um, as, sorry, that are very important as far as the kingdom is concerned. There are, there are things that the church has glossed over. We have placed a veneer of of modernity on them, and we have been running away from the truths of the scripture. I want to run through scripture for the next 30 minutes. Help all of us understand something that God spoke to me personally. I want to share with you my personal things and personal experiences with God. Over the past couple of days, I was waiting on God, praying and asking God for clarity of purpose and direction to life. I was asking God certain things, and why is it that there are Christians that will hang around greatness? I never sense it. It can be in a great place, serve under a great man of God, be in a great church, and yet things will go south. They pray, they fast, they give, they tithe, and yet things do not go well with them. I've been asking questions. The critical question that I asked myself was, can there ever be a way out? As I go to church and as I fast and as I pray, and, and this church is known for fasting. Your pastor, it happens to be a fasting man. He fasts and he prays as if he's crazy. He's crazy with fasting. He's crazy with prayer. He is keen on holiness and he loves God. The God-fearing man. I don't have friends. I keep brothers. And a brother should have traits that you can you can get through the DNA. You can, you can decode and know that there are similarities and traits. If the person is not a lover of God, a chaser of God, somebody who loves holiness and abhors evil, I don't want to know them. 
I don't even want to have any encounter with them. They invite me and I'm never available. I choose where I go. But you have a man like this. You serve under him. You are tithing. You are fasting. You are praying. How come a man can do all these things and yet nothing will happen? I've been praying for years, asking God for things for years. And yet it appears as if there will not be any way out. Today, I just want to share with you some few thoughts. I believe it will help you. Push you from where you are to where you ought to be. So if the Bible is yours, could you please lift it up and say, this is my Bible. It is the word of God. I'll become what it says I can become. I'll go where it says I can go. I will achieve what it says I can achieve. Slap your chest and say, I am a believer. Come on, do it again. Say, I am a believer. Now, if the Bible is yours, could you please turn to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 24. The 24th chapter of the second book written by the prophet, the premier prophet, Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter number 24. If you find it, you can say, I have it. If you're still looking for it, say, wait for me. I'm waiting, hurry up. 2 Samuel chapter number 24. Reading from the thundering diction of the King James Bible. From the verse number 11, it reads. Actually, let me back it up a bit and read from the verse number 10. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet God. David see us saying, go and say unto David, thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them that I may do it unto thee. So God came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or will thou flee three months from before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. The verse number, 24, the verse number 14, And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. I'm confused. This is a problem for me. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan even to Bethlehem 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. Stay now thy hand. Sheathe your sword. The angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Ar Arauna, the Jebusite. And David spoke unto the Lord when he saw that the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned. I have done wickedly. But these sheep, these people, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And God came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arauna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. Aruna said unto David, let me. Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for pen sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arona as a king give unto the king. And Arona said unto the king, The Lord God accepts thee. And the 
king said unto Araona, No, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer bent offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. So David brings so the anoint these lips of clay, O God, uh, stand in me and speak through me. That it will bless us all after it is done. In the name of the one who rules, reigns, and has regency. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. Before you take your seats, I would like you to look for seven people and ask them, do you have an altar? Come on, look for seven people. Do you have an altar? I hope the answers that your neighbor gave you were straight. Do you have an altar? Could you please take your seat if you ask that in faith? Do you have an altar? The things about life is that revelations will always introduce a revolution. And without revelation, there can't ever be a revolution in the life of any individual community, group of persons or people or any nation. There has to be a revelation for there to be a revolution. Now, revelations happen to be God opening up things that you need to understand because until you understand a paradigm, you can't shift it. What you can't understand and what you don't know can never benefit you. What will benefit a man is what he has full comprehension or um, an appreciable level of understanding therein. The world operates on systems. The world operates on principles. And until there is a fullness of understanding of what it is and how things ought to be, most of the time we don't get to places where God wants us to be. You have to get to a place where you have full understanding of how God wants things to go before you get what God has for you. The thing that I want to share with you is a thing that has been on my heart for a, time, for a period now. Things about the altar that we talk about. You get to church and we talk about altars and people run to the altar. The altar is not a playground. The altar is not a place where after service you can sit with your friend and chit chat. The altar is not a place for jesting or having conversations. The altar is not a joint for discussion. The altar is not a place where you wink and hoodwink and you do things to people. The altar happens to be a designated place where spiritual transactions are enacted. An altar in itself is a mystery. And the mystery will always produce two things. It is either the mystery produces a miracle or yields to your misery. A mystery will sometimes bring you miracles. And if you don't understand the, the mystery, it produces a misery in the life of the person who has had an encounter with the things under wrap. Most of the things in life are under wraps. They are covered. They are concealed. They are shrouded in a mystery. And one of them happens to be that of the altar. It is important that we try to understand some of these things because people of God, this happens to be the place where divine transactions are enacted. And so if you don't understand the working and the operations and the mechanisms of the altar, there is no way the altar can benefit you. Can be in the banner of grace. We have an altar called the altar of this church. You might hang around it and never be impacted by it. 
The fact that there is electricity in an area doesn't mean everybody has electricity in his house. Because for you to get electricity, you have to plug into or connect or tap from the main grid. So you can even have your wires and your sockets on everything, your switches on, and yet there will be no light because you've not connected. You can be around it and never benefit from it. And most of the time, the problem I've seen, why we don't benefit from it, happens to be that we lack the fullness of understanding of what it is. An altar happens to be a mystery. And I want you to bear with me because I want to take you on a journey. The first time an altar was mentioned in the Bible was in the book of Genesis chapter number 8. God had flooded the world and the Bible says that he had wiped out everything alive and spared only the things that were in the ark of Noah. Noah's ark had living things and when the, the things, the sea had receded, the water, the floods had receded, the Bible says that he, he got out and he killed animals and offered them for bent offerings unto God. Is it possible that when he offered the bent offerings, there are certain animals that became extinct? <laughs> because he was taking them in pairs. So if you took the male or the female, is it possible that they became extinct? And why should you make them extinct? And the Bible says that after that sacrifice was made, he built an altar, offered a sacrifice and a rainbow came and God said, I will not destroy the world with water again. But from today, sea time and harvest will never pass. Divine engagements were deployed because a man chose to erect an altar. An altar happens to be something that is lifted from the ground. This solid thing you see, this um, concrete or wood that you see here with the carpets. It doesn't have any power in itself. But it represents a system that ensures that divine power flows. So the altar happens to be a system and not an object. Altars are systems. When you go to a shrine, they will have carvings of and the systems that the spirit uses to deploy whatever they want to do. And so an altar happens to be a system that regulates a human destiny or the affairs of people. So altars are not taken lightly because an altar can determine how far you go or what becomes of your life. The battle of life and whatever you become in this world is dependent on the altar that works for you or works against you if it's a system. Because systems either favors one and brings another one down. If it is understood that an altar is a system, it means, it means systems can either work for you or work against you. An altar happens to be a system that regulates human activities. The Bible says, now I know that there is a God in this world that regulates, that reigns, that rules in the affairs of men. So it is a system that regulates whatever a man or an individual will become. The conquest of life, the victories of life, whatever a man or a woman will become in his lifetime is dependent on the altar that works for him or work against him. Life is not about verbiage. It's not about how grammatically astute or correct you are. You can speak the best of English. You can speak the best of French and still be impoverished because you see, wealth do not answer to language. It answers to altars. Wealth doesn't answer 
So you can be a professor and be broke. Because it is not about the knowledge that you have acquired. It is about the altar that is speaking for you. I teach in the university. I teach in the graduate school. I know of colleague professors who are impoverished and broke. It is not because they haven't had publications to their name. They have publications. They have been invited to us as guest lecturers, adjunct in other colleges and universities, and yet they are broke and impoverished because the systems of our world does not submit wealth on the altars of knowledge. It submits wealth on the altars and the principles of spiritual activities. It is how spiritually engrafted you are. That determines what works for you. C can I take you on a journey? I didn't come here to excite you. I came here to build a foundation tonight. The first time an altar was mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Genesis chapter 1. So God said, because of what you have done, this is what I will do. You have erected an altar. This is what I will do. But hitherto, before that time, Cain and Abel had lifted altars. An altar to live beyond a generation. Man of God. An altar carries weight and power that outlifts the one who erected it. Read the account of the man called Abraham. Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 12. You start reading and God will appear to the man called Abraham and say unto Abraham, Abraham, I am the Lord your God. Get thee out of your father's house, your mother's house. Go into the land that I will show you. He begins to wander, run around. He begins to sojourn. He moves across as a wanderer and a fugitive. He has no place to lay his head. He has no place. He moves about. And he Bethel. And so in Bethel, he erected an altar. Now, years down the line, Isaac erects an altar. Years down the line, now Jacob has also been wandering, moving as a fugitive. And whilst this man was moving as a fugitive, scripture says that he got to a place called Bethel, the same place that Abraham erected an altar. He was tired. He needed a place to lay his head. And so he picked up a stone. He laid his head on it and he began to dream. In his dream, this is what he saw. He saw that the place that the man of God called Abraham had erected an altar although he wasn't there there was a ladder connecting the earth to the heavens and angels were ascending and descending and why are you saying it was the place of the altar he said the Lord God was here and I knew it not it means that you might be in a place where you don't know that God is there but the altars of that place can speak for you or speak against you can, can I talk to somebody before I continue may the altars of God speak for your life wherever you are may the altars of the Elohim I, I, I want to take you on a journey please sit down sit down so this man had erected an altar and he had died there was no trace of the altar but the altar possesses an obsessive spirit the altar has a spiritual possession and obsession such that the things about the altar might not even be there anymore. But the presence never leaves. So the altar had caused divine exchanges. Now, the Bible says that there was a ladder from the earth to the heavens. What was happening on the ladder? There was traffic. There was traffic on the ladder where Abraham had lifted an altar, had caused a divine traffic. Said that whilst angels were going up, not an angel, whilst angels were going up, angels were coming down. And so an altar makes possible divine exchanges. What brings exchanges to people is when an altar is in place. An altar. I told you, it happens to be a system. The word for altar, which I will get to in a minute. And those of you who are thinking, 
please, we are in the grace era. Because this is banner of grace. And stop using Old Testament theology. Let me put a spin in your theology. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 13, the verse number 8. The Bible says, before the foundations of the earth was laid, the lamp was slain. It means that before Christ came, before you knew what was called grace and salvation, there was an eternal altar that had a perpetual sacrifice. And so the blood of the lamb was on the altar before man even came. Why? Because God knew that for him to be able to give to man and man to take from him, there should be an altar and a blood on that altar. And so check this out. The Bible says that every altar, now watch this, the Bible says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the testimony of their words. Why? Because every altar needs a priest. And the work of the priest is to receive the blood and give the word of the testimony. The blood happens to be the sacrifice. The word of the testimony happens to be the blessing that comes from the priest of the altar. So you go to a shrine and whilst they have their altar, they have their priest and you call them the fetish priest. The priest is not representing himself. The priest is representing the deity. When you touch anything around the priest, it is not the priest that will fight you. It is the deity the priest stands for that fights you. It is not about the priest anymore. We are on a journey. So the scripture cannot be broken. Altars happen to be places for spiritual transactions where things are enacted, decrees are made, enforcements are done. It is on the altar of Calvary that your redemption price was paid. On Golgotha's hills, the eternal blood, the blood pure blood that flows from the from the veins of Emmanuel. The blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins was shed on the altars of Calvary and it became a perpetual memorial before God. Every altar has a voice. Altars work for or work against. Now check this out. Check this out. Have you noticed that you might be very prayerful and yet have no access to certain dimensions even of your own faith? And sometimes you go on a retreat for even 20 days, 21 days, 40 days and yet nothing happens because life's battles are not won through fasting and prayer, they are won on altars. I want to share with you certain things of our faith. Life's battles are won on altars, not in prayer closets. People of God, the reason why we have a lot of prayer warriors but impoverished people is because we are putting square pegs around holes. For the slaughter. In the Greek language, the word for altar is the place of the Holocaust. In the Greek, in the Hebrew, is the place of the slaughter. In the Greek, is the place of the Holocaust. The Holocaust is simply mass slaughter. And it is important I bring that in because you see, most of us have gotten to places and we are coming from places where there has been mass slaughterings over our lives. There are certain families that nobody prospers and does well because certain things have been done on altars. Families have, there are people that have had their lives, destinies, sacrificed, slaughtered on certain altars. And so when you get to certain families, there are people who do not grow or live beyond certain ages. Long life 
has been compromised. Has been compromised. There are people who go to school in certain families. They do well for themselves academically. They get great contacts and yet they can't prosper. Why? Because prosperity has been and they tell you that oh okay this is what has happened and and, and that is what that, that what pains me is that we live in an era whereby even when people receive prophecy they are excited they go home and they write and they start praying about it wrong man of god it is an error you get prophecy and all that you do is to write it and you start praying and you tell people, and then because sorry, you're shaming come. Hey, and then they are sorry, yeah, yeah, man. So far, no, by one, no, by man. And come, sending you now, no, I'm telling you now. And you are excited, and you walk head high. And the next day, when you are coming to church, you come with swag because you have been very stupid. Because you see, when the prophecy was given to you, it was an introduction to a level. Levels also tells of warfares. Warfares are not worn with jackets. They are not worn with makeups. Whenever there is a prophecy in your life, it tells you that an altar is required because certain altars will try to swallow what has come upon you. The reason why people receive prophecies and they don't break through is because when they receive the prophecy, they prayed and never erected an altar. And so when you didn't erect an altar, the altars from your family came and said, we can't allow you to rise. And they were able to stop you from manifesting. But I pray that any altar that has been speaking against you from today, may the altar of our Christ and King begin to swallow any can I pray for somebody before I continue I pray that any altar I, I just I, I just feel like praying man of God any altar that has been lifted against your life from families from generations any altar that has been lifted against you may the altars of our God be lifted in your defense People of God, altars are very important. Altar symbolizes the presence of God. Whenever there is an altar, it talks about presence. It talks about visitations. It talks about the divine might. In the scripture, if, this, if, if you say that the altar represents the presence of God, one of the things you can use as an example is that of the Ark of the Covenant, man of God. The Ark of the Covenant was carrying the presence of God, which makes it an altar of the people. But it was a mobile altar, so that wherever they went to, they carried the altar of God with them. The Bible says that in the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 4, chapter number 5, chapter number 6, when there was warfare and the ark of God was, uh, they, they captured the ark of God, they seized the ark of God. The Bible says that when they picked the ark of God, they did not take it to the, to the, to, to the house of the king. They didn't take it to the palace. They knew that it was the altar of the people of Israel. So altars are not sent to the palace. They sent the altar of God against the altar of Dagon. The following day, Dagon, who was half man and half fish, had fallen prostrate before the ark of God. They came back and they said, no, this cannot happen. Uh, maybe there was a wind that blew our God apart. Let us fix him back. They did a reconstruction, a re-engineering, got him up. The next day when they came, the head was off. The limbs were cut off. Because it is only in the face of an altar that the efficacy of another altar can be tested. It takes an altar to defeat another altar. Altars are able to travel behind enemy lines. So the people of Israel could not get into the land of Philistia or into the houses and, and places of the Philistines. Yet, when they took the ark 
which is the altar of the people. Behind enemy lines to the altars of Dagon, the God of their altar rose and fought for them. I pray that wherever they will send your name to, may the God of your altars rise and fight for you. That wherever they send your name to, may the altars of God defend your cause. It takes an altar to defeat another altar. So when they were moving, it was an altar that defeated the altars of the I feel like preaching to somebody now. Takes an altar to defeat another altar. There is no power on earth. There is no force on earth. There is no entity that can defeat an altar. It takes an altar to defeat an altar. be affected. Why? Because if they can trace you to that bloodline, they can always manipulate the events. Can I take it a little bit deeper? It is important that we understand some of these things, people of God. That the altar happens to be the place where endorsements Ceilings, the seals, signs, and signatures of God or other deities come to play. Ooh. An altar can travel behind enemy lines. I don't have to follow you. My altar can. When somebody is fighting me, I don't have to fight back. Because the battles of life are won on altars. What gave David the courage to fight Goliath was not his armory. It was when Goliath had shifted the game to altars. And said, you are coming against me with this. Do you think I am a dog? And I curse you with the gods of my fathers. Curse you with the gods of Philistine. Curse you with the gods. And immediately, David went into praise and worship. David started thanking God. Because he knew that he didn't have the build up the physique to fight this giant. But if it is about an altar, his altars are stronger. And so, so he said unto them, you are coming up against me with, with this, but with your sword, with your shield, with the arrows, but I am coming against you in the name of the Lord our God. And so immediately it became an altar struggle. It was not about them anymore. Altars determine who wins the battle of life. You can ask the politicians if you meet them. When they want power, where they go. And the altars they submit to. So elections are even won on altars. Go back into history. Many years ago, they will tell you, before you become a president of the United States, you have to belong to the Bohemian Groove. Where they worship the magic, uh, the, the giant owl. And they choose who will lead the, the nation. And sacrifice on the altars. And once they sacrifice on the altars, no matter who you are, if you come, they will defeat you. Why? Because an altar has been deployed to fight. So you wouldn't know what will hit you. But you will go down. It takes an altar to defeat another altar. In the journey of life, what will make you successful is the altar that speaks for you. Can I explain those things? People of God, in the scripture that you just read, in the book of 2 Samuel 24, my long scripture that I read, the Bible says that, and God had told the man called David, don't take a census, don't count the people. Because if you count them, you are going to be discouraged. Their numbers are few. 
as compared to that of your adversaries. Don't count. Be still and know that I'm God. Don't count. I'm going to fight for you. The Bible says that David did not listen. He wanted to tickle himself. He, he, he wanted to bask in his own glory. And so he took the census, counted the people. And after counting, the Bible says that he realized that he had done a foolish act. But the prophet called God came. And God said unto him, King, three things God will want to do. You, you can only choose one. And you have to choose one. Whatever you choose will be the verdict. He said, okay, I'm listening. He said, God said the first thing is that you are going to have farming for seven years. Seven years where there will be no food. People will have to uh, kill each other to survive. There will be no food. Seven years. He said, okay. What's the second one? The second one is that you flee from your adversaries, your enemies for three months. They will pursue you. Okay. At least that is... Um, that is tolerable. Three months. If we have our strategies right, we'll be fine. Okay, what is the third one? The third one is that divine pestilence will come upon you for three days. He said, ah, I like that one. Why do you like that one, David? Because God is merciful. It is better for me to fall in the hands of God than to fall in the hands of man because the heart of man is desperately wicked. David was saying, I can't, I, can't, I can't allow myself to fall in the hands of my enemies. If it is God, at least he will have mercy. The Bible says that and he told him, so shall it be. That is the verdict. In a space of some few hours after the verdict, 700,000 men were killed by one angel. Prophet called God. And God said, David, this is an altar problem. God does not respond to tears and pleadings. He responds to altars. He said unto him, but, but it is me who did it. The 700,000 people, when I was taking the decision to count them, none of those guys were there. Why are they being killed? Not are they being killed? Not me, not my household. That is to tell you, altars have their own choices. The fact that you were not there before an enactment was made doesn't mean it won't have an impact on you. So there are certain people that the altars that are speaking against you are altars from generations before you were born. You are thinking, but I had no hand in it. I, I wasn't there. What have I done? What did I do to, be, uh, to suffer under this yoke? And the answer was there. He was the one who did it. But everybody around him started dying. You know that if somebody in the family went and consulted a demonic altar, that altar doesn't know your name. It only knows a bloodline. So it comes against a bloodline. And so if it is from, if it's from your father's line, it looks for everybody with the same DNA. And it starts killing people. So people's lives are, 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 are under serious shackles and bondages. Not because they are not praying, but because there are certain sacrifices on certain altars that are working against them. They have no hand in it. They didn't commit any evil. They have not sinned against God. But the altars are so strong that no matter where they run to, the altars look for them. But I pray in the name of Jesus that any altar from your mother's line, any altar from your father's lineage that has been speaking and working against you from today in the name of Jesus, may the altars of our God be erected and fight for you. Altars. Who was these altars? The, the God, the prophet, said unto him, Prophet David, you have prophesied before, but this you didn't know. Your spiritual understanding on the things of the spirit, my prophet, my king, is is low. What do you mean? He said it is an altar issue. It was because of an altar that has been erected. That is why 
people are being killed to appease the deity. God was appeasing himself on his own altars. The killing of the people was to place blood on the altar. He said, if you want that to stop King David, you don't need to go on a retreat. You need to erect another altar so that the altar you will erect will speak against the altar that has been erected against you. Really? The Bible says that and he erected an altar and sacrificed and immediately that thing stayed. It means there was seizure to the killings. Now let me show you a mystery here. There are two kinds of altars. Apart from the general category, demonic altar and divine altar. We have what we call the corporate altar. A corporate altar is, can I get two of the ministers? Come. Two of you can come. Yeah, two. Come. So we have what we call the corporate altar. And the corporate altar happens to be the altar of an assignment, a commission, or a mandate. Banner of grace has an altar. This altar that you see is the consecrated place from which divine enactments are made. When is a corporate altar because this altar speaks for all of us. It speaks for every member of the banner of grace church. So these ministers of the gospel or of the house if this man has a problem against this man and this man has a problem against this man and they all come to the altar for redress they all come here and pray on the altar one after the other and you call on each other's name and say God I pray and I make an invocation against my brother or that man that what he has been saying about me and doing against me pray right now that may the altar rise and defend me if this man has been placing seats on the altar and this man has been placing seats on the altar because every altar protects the offering and the offerer the altar will not work against this man and the altar will not work against this man at that point the altar will protect them both and will not destroy any of them. Because the altar protects the offering and the offerer. Can I take you a bit deeper? However, if there is a battle and a competition amongst them, one of them will have to emerge victorious. How will that happen? That comes to the second altar. That is not the corporate altar, but what we call the private altar. A private altar is what this man has been doing between himself and God. And what this man has been doing between himself and God. So that if this altar is nullified based on their corporate service to the altar. What they do in their secret place. The altar of your secret place is what will speak for you. When there is no other person there to even defend your cause. And so David said, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It takes the secret altars that you build between yourself and your God to speak for you in times of adversity. It takes an altar. So your private altar is what works for you when both of you are serving the same altar. Unfortunately, we live in an era where we don't understand what is even called your private or personal altar. So in your church, you have your corporate altar. But in your personal life, you build your private altars called your secret place, your place of power. So when you are coming against the man of God and you are in the church, you are a member of Banner of Grace, you are a pastor of Banner of Grace. You are a minister of Banner of Grace. Because you serve the same altar. 
When you do something against Pastor Ajima, it will not happen that the altar will kill you. It won't happen. But what will happen is, in his secret place, he has a secret altar. That if you kick against him, the altar is deployed to devour anything that rises against him because the secret place happens to be his place of power. I pray that may the Lord grant you your private altar that whatever will speak against you. Can I pray for somebody before I continue? I pray that may the Lord help him, help him. May the Lord God of your secret place, may the mighty hand of God of your secret place, may altars be erected for you that whatever thing that is against, if the altar carries presence, can, can I continue? I, can, can I continue? The altar, the altar. If the altar is the symbol of the presence of God, the altar stands for his presence. If it stands for his presence, then we can say that the rod of Moses happened to be an altar. Because it carried the presence of God. Oh. And because he carried the presence of God, it led him to places of conquest and victories. May the altars that God has place look for somebody. Tell the person, I have an altar. Tell the person, be mindful, be careful. Be careful when you are speaking against me, be careful. Because I have an altar that can speak for me. I have an altar that can defend my cause. I have an altar that will bring me rest and respite. I have an altar that will land my, my sail uh, surely. I have an altar. I have an altar. People that have altars, when you are dealing with them, you should be mindful. Because their currency is different. You come against them and the Bible says on the way to Damascus when Paul before he became Paul when Paul was Saul on his way to Damascus a light shone from heaven and the Bible says he made him blind and he, the, he heard a voice from heaven Saul, Saul why art thou persecuting me? He said who am I? That, 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 who are you Lord? Who are you? And the Bible says that and the Lord said unto him you cannot kick against the prick because what he was saying is you have no idea the altars you are up against altars are the only thing that makes people untouchable what makes you untouchable is the altar you submit to and the altar that works for you it's an altar Life is an altar thing. It is not grammar. It is not school. It is not certificate. It is about the altar that works for you. Why do you think a man can work for 80 years? Never make money. Somebody will go and consult an altar and tell, they tell the person sleep in a coffin. For three days he comes out and within three months he starts buying houses. Because wealth do not respond to age. It responds to altars. It is not how long you have lived. It is the altar. No matter how old you are, it is the altar that speaks for you. The altars of your secret place. So the man called Moses will have his rod that symbolized the presence of God. And the rod, the Bible says, God told him that that is the typology of presence at all times. He gets to a place where he is confronted with challenges and any time he was confronted with a challenge, check out your account. He didn't go into prayer. He stretched the rod. Because in your place and moments of adversity, it is your altar that works. So he gets to the Reed Sea or Red Sea and it takes an altar to open the Red Sea. He needs water. It takes an altar, the, the rod, to bring out the water. 
Whatever he needed, it was the rod that brought it. But check out the account. When he got before Pharaoh the king, and the Bible says that he had laid down the rod and it turned into a serpent. The enchanters, the necromancers, the wizards, the people, the, the, the prophets of Pharaoh, they also laid it down and it also turned into snakes. Why? Because satanic altars are also powerful. But when the altars came against the altar, the Bible says, and the altar of Moses did not have to even pursue them. He opened its mouth and started sucking them in. Do you know the mystery of the swallowing of the snakes? Let me tell you. After the snakes were swallowed, the rod of Moses did not become bigger. It did not increase in size. The rod of Moses never increased in size although it had absorbed other rods in. Do you know why? Because the capacity of our God makes the capacity of the devil negligible. The capacity of our God makes the capacity of the devil negligible. Let me try to explain that. It means that no matter the altar that you are confronted with, you have an altar that can swallow the altars of the devil. Therefore, any altar that has been erected against you, I pray that may the altars of our God swallow any satanic altar. I, I don't know, but I feel like praying. Be upstanding. I, 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 maybe I want, to, I want to close and maybe continue on that tomorrow. The altars of our God is able to swallow any satanic altar. So in certain families, marriages have been slaughtered. So nobody is able to get married. They go into marriages, they are brought back home. Have a child. Become a single mom. That's it. There are other families that whoever marries your husband has to die. So they will not leave you, but they die. They will not say that there is a, I want a divorce. No, 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 but they die. Oh, three weeks ago, a lady from another church met me and said, man of God, please pray for me. I said, what happened? I said, said I, I married just six months ago and my husband just died. Check through the bloodline through prayer and the Lord told me there is a supernatural imposition an altar has spoken against them you try so hard to break through in your life and the harder you try even the more difficult things become it's because altars are against you I told you there are altars that are erected without your consent Lamentation says our fathers have sinned and they are no more. And we are buried the burdens of their iniquities. So there are certain things that were done in ages past. And you are bearing the wrath. Life is an altar thing. People of God. It is not always about spending 20 hours in prayer. Because there are people who have done well without praying. I'm telling you. Prayer solidifies your relationship with God. Prayer makes you closer to God. But prayer in itself, in itself. Let me not shake your theology. Let me not shake your theology. I want you to remain chaste and pure as far as your theology is concerned. Because you can pray for hours, I'm telling you. If all tests are against you, and it's not, all tests are not broken with prayer. All tests are only slaughtered on all tests. Nobody went before Dagon and pulled Dagon down. It took an altar to destroy it. <laughs> Moses did not have to smite the serpents and kill them before, he, before his altar. No, the altar is self-sufficient. In defending itself. All tests can never be helped. 
altars can only be serviced. You can't help an altar. When Uzi wanted to help the ark, he died. The same altar that killed Uzi, when it went into the house of Obedidom, for three months, he became a multi-millionaire. Obed Edom became a multi-millionaire in three months because of the same altar. One decided to help the altar. He, he got killed. One decided to service the altar and he prospered. So your prosperity is connected to your relationship with the altar. I have known people who have been praying. I read it, I read it, I mean, break it through. How? Just some pioneer breaking me through, breaking me through. I already break him through. Silly me, I'm there. Cut my life. So I already Papa is silly, no. And me, Jesus, my dad, me done in atomic bomb. Me blast it. Then Jesus, my dad, ballistic missile, weapon of mass destruction. Me set it on fire. Me blast it again. Me done in a grad. I'm in the gym. My dad, Jesus, my dad, chase it. Me the sim, me the kuma, me the bomb, me the hammer, bomb, me bomb. We start a boss, empire, and kabe kraki and kakraki. Because they don't respond to that language. Sa language no kwa munti asye. In the spirit realm, what has power is blood and the word of the priest. Hannah went to pray. The Bible says that and they go there yearly to pray. One day, a priest came and said, why should you be drunk at this time of the day? He said, no, I'm not drunk. My heart is heavy. I need something from God. He took this priest some few minutes to bring to this woman what she had been looking for for years. So victories are given by two things. The blood of the lamp, one. And number two, the testimony of our words. It means that you need a priest to usher you after altars have been erected to places of victory. Today I came to do a simple work. I'm not here to, I, I told you, I'm here to just lay a foundation. So that in this week, you will have encounters of God. It's about the altar. Are you following? It's about the altar. Can we pray? So that tomorrow I can continue. I have work to do tomorrow too. But it takes an altar to make an alteration. So if you need a change in your life, an altar is required to alter the, the events of your life. Can I get you lifting up your right hand? Say, Lord Jesus. Any altar, any altar erected against erected me, erected against from my mother's side, from my mother's side, or from my father's side, or from my father's side, as I lift up my as voice, I lift up my and voice, as I begin to pray, and I begin to pray, I deploy the altars of God against those altars, against those in altars. the name of Jesus, in the name of lift Jesus. up your voice and begin to pray. <laughs> Rika para basi ya dalebo, 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 rika para
Jesus name. Father, in the name of Jesus. Any altar that has been erected against your people. Today, first of all, we deploy the altars of the banner of grace to swallow any satanic altar. Amen. Wherever your name has been placed, things that have been done against you, we pray in the name of Jesus that the altars of our God will work for you, will speak for you, will benefit your life. Amen. May the altars of our King the altars of this assembly, the altars of the man of God, of his secret place, may that altar, as the priest of the altar, so for my back, as the priest of the altar, I told you that every altar has a priest. And I'm going to allow the priest of this altar to bring a word over your life. Because that is what the Lord told me about altars. You don't stand on an altar that you are not a priest of and bring blessings on the people without the priest. So I will allow the priest of this altar to work for you. Now watch this. But the altar and the word that comes out of the altar is never powerful without blood. So you will always require blood before the word comes. It's by the blood of the lamb first. Before the word of their testimony. So before the word of our testimony comes. The blood of the lamb must be. David when he was about to do that. He said I wouldn't give anything to God. That will not cost me. First Samuel. Second Samuel 24. I am going to put envelopes on the altar. You know what will cost you. I do not even mention any amount. But activate the altar. You might not even have it now. It doesn't matter. Pick that envelope. That this is my altar envelope. And write on it. Servicing my altar. And I want you to. Can I get the envelopes? Please. Before man of God. Before you even say anything. Can you open it? Ministers, open it for me and give it to me. I want to do it myself. Spirit of God. Can you take all these things from the altar? Take the monies and everything from the altar. Take it away. Take the fruits and everything. Take them. Take them away. I don't want anything on the altar apart from these that I'm about to put on the altar. Leave the envelopes. Leave those envelopes. Can I have them? Nobody has to tell you what you should do. I'm not going to tell you put a thousand, put twenty thousand, put hand. No, no, no. You know what will cost you. And I want you to come for it yourself. Man of God, can you stand on the altar? 
I want the altar of the banner of grace to swallow any satanic altar. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I declare, let this author cancel every satanic author as they are raising an author for themselves, for their family, for their marriages, for their businesses, for their corporate world. Jesus, your name we decree. As a priest of this house, I speak and I decree. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. As Aragadosa, be at May this altar as a priest of this house of God. Ia babario sa tabare kebiri. Kaya la la bosa. Iria tatabare bosa kabeya. In the name of Jesus. Kaya dosa tiri bikaba. Iyo talaba so tiri bikaba. In the name of Jesus. I speak by the power of God and I decree maratos. Hey, karabara bosa kadosa raba. May this altar speak against any invisible altars, any satanic altars, any demonic altars that is speaking against your ministry, that is speaking against your life, that is speaking against your marriage, that is speaking against your promotion, that is speaking against your health. In the name of the Lord, arapata parosa ba. Even if you have made a mistake and God has raised an altar against you and the prophet God saw David what to do and there was divine intervention. May this altar bring you divine intervention. May this altar bring you divine elevation. May this altar bring you divine escape against any satanic and premature devil. We avert it. We avert it. We avert it. We nullify it. In the name of Jesus, this altar will speak volumes for you. This altar will speak for you and your children. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, where your parents could not go, this altar will take you there. Where your father could not touch, this altar will take you there. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I stand here with my brother. You sent him to us today to open our eyes. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. He think how many years and decades I want word from Eli. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. May this altar speak for you and your children. I decree in the name of the Lord that any satanic altars, that any invisible altars, that any human altars, that any demonic altars, that any envious and jealous altars that is working against you by this altar we lift it against. This author will speak for you and your children. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we call it done. I want you to shout it, believe it, amen. amen. And a big amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, I, I thought you would do it better. Do it well. Praise the Lord. What a revelation. Amen. Please be, sit down for me. How many of us are enjoying it? This is a very powerful. And that is why I always tell you that be very careful about a man with authors and a man with covenant. And tonight, listen, anytime God sends his prophet to us, I told you that this week is apostolic week. And these are some of the mysteries that God will do. David said to Aurora that I won't give you a God anything that will not cost me. A thing that will not cost me. Please, let me advise you this. Don't make this thing like a normal usual thing that you pick an envelope and you just do it here. No. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. No. Where your heart is, that is where. I always say that God doesn't answer prayer. He answers your heart and your obedience. The Bible says, if the children of obedience be complete, I, the Lord, will avenge the children of disobedience. Amen and amen. 
All right, shall we be on our feet? Lift up our second offering. Shall we take our offering? I want the ashes to bring me the offering bow. By the direction, directions of the ashes, we come from the back. Lift up your offering and let's wait. Take a very good offering. Take a very good offering. And be on your feet if you have taken your offering. Be on your feet and thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray over this offering. That your word say we should honor you with our first and best. Jehovah, we decree and we declare. And bless this offering. In Jesus' name, we call it done. Amen and amen.